Hey yo, what's up guys? So welcome back to the channel where my lighting changes every 30 seconds. Yeah, I have yet to still get that new equipment. So if it's distracting, you know why. All right, so I watch TV a lot. In fact, you could probably say that binging Netflix is a talent of mine. <laughs> I've seen some pretty awesome shows that I really loved and others that were not so great and others that had the potential to be better but were ruined by bad child acting. Point is, I'm addicted to television and I thought what better idea for a video than to ramble about all those television shows that I believe could have stayed on air for longer if it weren't for those darn ratings. TV shows that weren't nearly as popular popular as they deserve to be. Also to be clear, I'll be including shows that are still on air or were meant to be a miniseries but could still use a bigger fan base and are generally underrated anyway. I have trouble finding people who aren't family or strangers on the internet who have watched these shows. If I can get one of you guys to at least try out one of the shows on this list, then I'd be happy. And I have no idea how to do smooth transitions, so... Yep. Hey man, are you seeing this beautiful morning? What are you doing? How are you? What am I doing? I'm set up here like you asked me to. Oh, right, duh. Kicking off our list is Barry and oh man, Bill Hader. He is too good for us. Barry tells a story of a soldier turned hitman who, jaded by his life of crime, believes he's meant for some greater purpose. And after being assigned a new job, he tracks his target down to a rinky-dink acting class taught by the Fonz. Instead of doing his job of murdering the guy, he realizes that he's finally found that greater calling, acting. It's both a dark and hilarious show about morality, identity, and I may be biased, but I am a huge, huge fan of Bill Hader. And he absolutely makes this show. I used to box Bill Hader as just this comedic goof. The only times I saw him were when he was playing this overreactive side character in comedies or his extremely caricatured characters on SNL. You know, Alan, the Californians, that one skit where he just screams the entire time. You make me but seriously, Barry shows not only Bill Hader's like wide acting range, it also shows his diverse set of skills. He was the writer and director for most of the episodes, including the season one premiere. And I'm not gonna lie, as a hitman, I have to say I found him quite attractive. A female reporter will say, I never found you attractive, Bill, but when you're shooting someone, I find you really attractive. Wow. wow. That's it's like fascinating. weird. It's I like, just spat all um, no, I, so I loved it. And of course, you got this amazing cast. You've got Henry Winkler, you got Anthony Kerrigan, you got that, that guy from The Joker. Damn it, what was his name? Glenn Fleshler. I should probably do my research a little bit more before I start mouthing off in front of the camera. Also, I believe this is Sarah Goldberg's debut role and she is fantastic in the series, so keep an eye out for her. She's a rising star. It's heartfelt, it's intense, it's witty, it's just it's just such a hidden gem of a show. It's too bad it came on like right after Game of Thrones, but it has been getting recognition in its own right through multiple Emmy nominations and I think a few awards here and there as well. And it is on its way for a third season. I'm sure it's coming out sometime this year, although, you know, with what's happening, it was delayed. But yeah, be sure to check it out. Aziraphale, it's me. We need to talk. Yes, I rather think we do. I assume this is about Armageddon. If you're a fan of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy or anything by Neil Gaiman, then Good Omens is probably your ideal show right now. This quirky prize of a show centers on the demon Crowley and the angel Aziraphale, two vastly different forces who form an unlikely friendship. They keep it on the down low since one's from hell and the other's from heaven, and I'm pretty sure those two don't mix. So they enjoy their time, you know, getting drunk, living up on Earth until the Antichrist is born, and the two must join forces to stop the apocalypse in the final battle between heaven and hell from taking place on on Earth and destroying all life within it. The visuals are great for the most part, and it's got a vibrant color palette to it that adds to this whimsical fantasy aesthetic. But yeah, one gripe is that the CGI can get a little bit distracting, but really that's just me nitpicking. Also, if you're a huge fan of Queen, you're gonna love the soundtrack, trust me. It's also got this hilarious script, like anybody who's familiar with Douglas Adams' humor. So, you know, Hitchhiker's Guide, Dirk Gently's Holistic Agency, I think that's the title of that. It's actually Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency. So yeah. Um, yeah, you're gonna like the quirky sort of deadpan dialogue that's in the show. But I must add a disclaimer, 
it is not for everyone. It does lampoon somewhat the Christian religion. In fact, there was a boycotting controversy where upwards of 20,000 Christians petitioned for the show to be taken down on Netflix when it's actually on Amazon Prime, so you really got him there, guys. But if that's not something you're sensitive to and you like your weird and wacky shows with a modern take on angels, demons, heaven and hell, then Good Omens is definitely worth the watch. On the subject of controversial religious mockery, Things will escalate, that's what these things do, they escalate. And violence makes violence, makes nothing much at all. Preacher, enough. I'm gonna be very biased. Preacher was my favorite show to have ended last year. Based on the comics by Garth Ennis, Preacher follows the batshit crazy adventures of Jesse Custer, a chain-smoking, liquor-loving preacher with a dark past, who one day gets possessed with a supernatural, godlike power to command anyone to do his bidding, in some cases a lot more literally than others. To better understand the purpose of his newfound power and why he was chosen, he joins forces with his trigger-happy ex-girlfriend Tulip and junkie alcoholic vampire Cassidy to literally find God and ask him all the questions a mortal being may have. And of course, along the way they encounter little beings from heaven and hell and some seriously depraved people. The show was adapted by Seth Rogen, Evan Goldberg, and Sam Catlin, the executive producer of Breaking Bad. And Rogen and Goldberg, you know, producers of This Is The End and Sausage Party and a heap and pile of other famous stoner comedies you might have heard of. Which I have to admit, work well in drawing me into the show because I love Breaking Bad and I love all those other movies except maybe Sausage Party. But anyway, Preacher just hit all the right notes for me in terms of fantasy, comedy, and action. Oh my gosh, the action. I hope whoever choreographed the fight scenes goes on to do more projects because they honestly reminded me of those epic fight scenes in Kingsman. And for some reason, we're always set to the most unexpected songs. And of course, with Rogan and Goldward's handprints all over this, the dialogue and the characters were all hilarious. Cassidy was easily one of my favorite TV characters of last year. And honestly, maybe even of all time. I actually named these Tea Turtle plushies after the trio, so now you know how cool I am. But of course, this show is not for everyone. Like Good Omens, actually even more so, it unapologetically lampoons the Christian religion, which has resulted in many angry viewers. But at the same time, it has this hugely dedicated fan base. But yeah, honestly, I could go on and on and on about how much I love the show and why you guys should watch it, but if you guys like your dark humor, slice of dark fantasy with really violent but fun action scenes, then you're gonna have a fun time with Preacher, trust me. The books are also super good. Like, they delve a lot more into the characters, but I gotta say that the show is pretty much like Seth Rogen's fan fiction. I'm not sure how, like, lovers of the comic are gonna like his adaptation of the source material, but it's definitely still worth a watch, I think. So yeah, check out Preacher. If you're a fan of the comics or the show, let me know because I've yet to know beyond like five people who actually like this franchise. So it'd be nice to fangirl with some new fans. Anyway, on to another Seth Rogen production. Listen carefully. Everything that happens in the biotic wars is real. The biotics, the wars, everything. The game is a recruitment and training tool sent back in time to find the one person with the skills to save us. Savior. I've yet to find someone other than my dad who introduced me to the show who's actually seen the show. Future Man is a sci-fi comedy that stars Josh Hutcherson playing this janitor by day, gamer by night 23 year old who's hell bent on beating the world's most challenging video game known as the Biotic Wars. When he reaches the final level, the game's two main characters appear before him and turns out that the Biotic Wars is real and they've chosen Josh, who's also named Josh in the show, to be their newest recruit in saving the world. Once again, this is another Seth Rogen production, so I have to note that it it does feature your typical staunchy, pot-laced Seth Rogen humor. But if you like that kind of stuff, then you're gonna have a fun time with this one. And if that's not your thing, then yeah, still give it a try. But definitely expect there to be a lot of sex jokes and pot jokes and surprisingly a lot of bear. I personally found the show to be incredibly hilarious and clever, but then again, I, I love Seth Rogen stuff. The series is like a haven for pop culture homages, and some episodes are dedicated to parodying certain formats like another series that I'll be talking about in a moment. The characters are super likable, and it's fast-paced, action-packed, and with its 20 to 30 minute runtime per episode, it's incredibly bingeable. Also, for those who like fun time travel movies like Back to the Future, Days of Future Past, insert another mainstream time travel movie here, you know, the ones that don't really take the mechanics too seriously, then you're gonna have a blast with Future Man. And I, being a time travel junkie myself, I had a lot of fun. So check it out. In my opinion, the first season was the best. It kind of slows down a little bit in the second season, but with the third being their final one, they kind of went all out with the craziness and it, it's just, it's a blast, trust me. What do you think is wrong with you? I'm sick. 
if I don't matter. What would you say this trial is showing you about yourself? Is this therapy now? It's not therapy. It's science. So Maniac was a passion project miniseries between Emma Stone and Jonah Hill that premiered on Netflix. Maniac focuses on two misfit strangers, a woman named Annie who struggles from relationship problems and family issues, and Owen, the son of a wealthy family who suffers from schizophrenia. The two decide to participate in a pharmaceutical trial that promises to eliminate all their psychological problems, if only, right? With no side effects whatsoever. And of course, as these things play out, things don't go according to plan, and the two leads learn some pretty insightful stuff about themselves and and each other. So I love sci-fi and media that properly portrays the subject of mental health, and seeing as these two was a blend of both, it was a pretty sweet deal for me. First off, the mental health aspects were really well approached. They approached it empathetically, but didn't romanticize it. And without getting to super spoiler territory, I would say that a lot of it reminded me of Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, which was a really, really good sci-fi movie from the early 2000s, I believe, starring Jim Carrey and Kate Winslet. If you guys haven't seen it, I can't recommend it enough. It's got this super unique storyline that probably has the most accurate portrayal of dreams that I've seen in a movie, while at the same time tackling the complexities of rocky relationships. But I digress. Part of Maniac's strength were the really mind-bending concepts to the plot. When watching the show, pay attention to the little easter eggs and hints that they sprinkle throughout the episodes. There are also some beautiful visuals and some really interesting ideas on what a technologically advanced future would seem like. I'd say this show was like an extended episode of Black Mirror. The acting was great, I love Jonah Hill, that was the first time I probably saw him in a really serious role, and Emma Stone was amazing and made me cry. I really like seeing these two together, I like them in Superbad, and they bounced off of each other really well in this series. So I recommend this for anyone who's keen on technological sci-fi stories, and of course if you like the subjects of mental health, trauma, social relationships, then give Maniac some love on Netflix. What is community college? You've heard it's loser college for remedial teens, 20-something dropouts, middle-aged divorcees and old people keeping their minds active as they circle the drain of eternity. That's what you heard. However, I wish you luck. Okay, you know, uh-oh. Okay, there's more to this speech. There's actually a middle card that is missing. Can we all look around? So way before the birth of the meme machine that's now Rick and Morty, Dan Harmon aired his first mainstream brainchild on NBC called Community. The series was about seven misfits who form a study group at their deadbeat community college, Greendale, and it was a master at subversion, parody, and paying homage to beloved pop culture movies and tropes. It was literally a goldmine for anybody who loved movies and TV. Despite having Dan Harmon at the helm and the Russo brothers directing each episode, yep, the guys who directed half of the Marvel franchise, the show was always on the brink of death. And even though it had an incredibly talented cast that featured Alison Brie, The Soup's Joel McHale, Chevy Chase, Childish Gambino, The Hangover's Ken Jeong, Community always lacked the love that it deserved on air. I think one of the biggest reasons why this was was because Dan Harmon got so experimental with the series. The show changed formats and themes often, and that didn't always land with viewers. Some episodes were entirely dedicated to parodying an iconic movie or TV show. The entire thing was incredibly reliant on pop culture references. It was like Dan Harmon's niche little love letter to the geek community. In saying that, the show wasn't really designed to capture mass audiences, and it was pretty ambitious in its content. As a result, if you're really popular with a small group of movie nerds but you fail to capture general audiences, you're not going to really do well in network ratings. That's just sadly how it goes. They also made the absolutely stellar choice of firing Dan Harmon the show's creator. It was rumored that he was hard to work with and he couldn't really keep up with deadlines because he was a perfectionist and wanted every episode up to his standard of quality. Artists, am I right? So this eventually led to an abominable fourth season that felt like it peeled the skin off of the original show, Ward pretending to be like Community, only further decomposing as it went on. Thankfully, Harmon did come back for the fifth season and had a lot of not so nice things to say about how the fourth one was handled. And it at least sort of found its wheels again, if not sort of skidding a little here and there. And eventually it was revived and put on Yahoo? At that point, it was basically a zombie of a show trying hard to replicate its past glories until it was finally put to rest in 2015. You've probably come across a whole bunch of memes about Community, namely the hashtag six seasons in a movie. So we haven't gotten that movie yet, but I do think that it made three seasons of amazing comedy that were probably some of the best ever in television history, or at least for what I've seen on television. So I can't recommend this show enough. And speaking of high quality, well-written shows that were absolutely sh** on by ratings. Okay, Lindsay, are you forgetting that I was a professional twice over, an analyst and a therapist, the world's first analrapist? 
Yes, and you were almost arrested for those business cards. Yes, no, it did not look good on paper, but I didn't stop because of the police inquiries. I stopped to raise our little daughter. Arrested Development suffered a pretty similar fate to Community. It was too clever for its own good, let's just say. The show revolved around a dysfunctional family known as the Bluths, who were incredibly rich and at the top of the real estate industry. Suddenly, they find themselves bankrupt when their dad is arrested for fraud. And at the center of it all is Michael Bluth, played by Jason Bateman, who pretty much plays himself. And he takes on the challenge of keeping his incredibly unhinged family together. And of course, unexpected hijinks and a whole lot of hilarious misfortune ensues. So this show was incredibly well written, and I know I've said that for all the other shows on this list, but I can't stress it enough for Arrested Development. I think it's super challenging. It's it's hard to be able to write a unique comedy that's still consistently hilarious with each episode, but Arrested Development excelled in doing that. You know, you get your moments where you haven't even finished laughing at one joke and the script already swoops in with an even bigger one. And they were really smart with their comedy. So for Arrested, it's something that you have to watch in chronological order. And this may have contributed to its downfall because perhaps audiences were tuning in to random episodes out of order and that could turn off new viewers. The way that it worked is that they would plant a joke in season one, sort of build up on it in season two until it had the grand payoff in season three. And for those who have seen the show, you know exactly the kind of jokes I'm referencing. But you hardly see that in comedy these days. Arrested Development, like Community, was always on the brink of cancellation, despite literally scoring dozens of Emmy nominations and actual awards and a bunch of other accolades, including Golden Globe for Best Actor. For some reason, it just always got the short end of the stick. I seriously can't wrap my head around how shows like The Big Bang Theory literally got 12 seasons and shows like Community and Arrested Development were always somehow on life support. But I digress, if eccentric characters, stylish directing, and subversive comedy is your thing, then definitely check Arrested Development out. Seriously, it's something that I think everyone needs to watch at least once. Uh, this is Valencia, my girlfriend. Hi, nice to meet you. Oh. Milady. You are, you're just so pretty. I mean, you have a great body. Well, I teach yoga, keeps me fit. Oh my God, I love yoga. That's so funny that we're meeting right now because I love yoga. Well, maybe you should come to one of my classes. I would love that. I would love to have you. I would love to be happy. Wow. Why are the voices so high? Crazy Ex-Girlfriend was a treat for musical nerds like me. It follows the shenanigans of Rebecca Bunch, a Yale slash Harvard graduate turned lawyer who's tired and depressed of her corporate New York life. She suffers a panic attack when offered a promotion and after fleeing her building, bumps into her high school ex, Josh. She discovers that he's leaving New York to live in West Covina, California. And in a true nervous breakdown moment, she decides that he's her key to happiness and moves all the way to West Covina. And here, our crazy and hilariously entertaining plot ensues. So the lead star of the show is Rachel Bloom, and if you haven't seen her YouTube videos, I recommend if you're a fan of irreverent comedy, she's brilliant and absolutely musically talented. And that same talent shines in the show in the form of quirky musical numbers. Hilarious dialogue paired with her perfect comedic timing, and actually the rest of her co-stars do pretty great with the comedic material they're given. All the characters in the show are incredibly entertaining to watch, and surprisingly, for a show that gives off this lighthearted rom-com vibe, they all offer some pretty complex layers of personality that I've got to really applaud the series for. There are no binary good versus bad characters in the show that are stereotypical of the genre. And that makes them a lot more human and relatable, unlike other CW shows I know. And of course, a lot of its strength lies in its all original songs, with performances from actual Broadway stars like Gabrielle Ruiz, Donna Lynn Champlin, Skylar Austin, and Santino Fontana. You know, the d bag from Frozen. It was also directed by Mark Webb, who did 500 Days of Summer, The Spectacular Now, and those never happen, we don't talk about those. It's also cool how the show touches on Filipino culture and has a fair handful of Filipino characters, which, you know, being of that nationality, I appreciate that. What's really sad is that in all its uniqueness and the niche genre that it carried, like all other shows on this list, it had less than stellar ratings. Crazy X ended after a four season run and did have the ability to wrap up their story, but it did land the top spot as one of the network's least watched shows, or I think one of network TV's least watched shows in general. But it's currently available on Netflix, so if you like musicals, you like your dark slash cringe slash satire humor, then you might just get hooked onto the show. Schon vor Wochen ist in der Kleinstadt Winden ein 15-jähriger Junge auf mysteriöse Weise verschwunden. Und nun alarmiert ein weiterer Vermisstenfall die Bürger der Stadt. Keine Spur, nichts. Als hat er sich in Luft aufgelöst. 
So dark I got curious about because people were calling it the German Stranger Things, which it's really not, but I kind of get why they'd say that. The show revolves around four interconnected families in the small fictional town of Winden, Germany. When their children start mysteriously disappearing for no reason, a sinister time travel conspiracy starts to unravel as the families start discovering dark secrets, hidden double lives, and disturbing pasts amongst themselves. Now, as much as I want to go on about how brilliant the show is, I can't really do so without spoiling some pretty major plot points that enhance the experience as you watch them unfold yourself. But that's what the show is good at, you know? It keeps you hooked with all these plot twists and all these unpredictable mysteries. And as far as similarities with Stranger Things goes, I mean, it's got kids and sci-fi elements, but it's got an incredibly complex plotline. And not to rag on Stranger Things, but if, if that show were Spielberg, let's just say this one is Christopher Nolan. Again, I can't say too much about the show without completely ruining it for you guys, but I was constantly mind blown about how clever and smart the writing was. For me, it's probably one of the most quality sci-fi shows in TV history. I say that like I've seen so many sci-fi shows in my time. <laughs> no, but for real, Dark is an S-tier sci-fi show, and if you like your complex plots that leave you thinking with a dash of time travel to go along with it, then definitely check out Dark. And of course, I would probably be burned at the stake if I didn't mention this one, but... Hey, they may kosherize rules. I'm thinking somebody needs to put you down, dog. What do you think? I'm thinking we'll rise again. Every man there, go back inside, or we will blow a new crater in this little moon. Firefly, my gosh, this show will always be a picture of wasted potential. But not on Joss Whedon's part. Oh no, he did everything pretty much perfectly with the one and only season of the show. The series takes place 500 years in the future. Humans were forced to leave Earth due to lack of resources and they formed new colonies on the many moons and planets of a new solar system. The central planets decided to form what became the Alliance, who decided that all other planets had to join under their rule. However, the more outer rim planets, known as the Independents, fought against this, erupting a civil war. Cult favorite Nathan Fillion plays Malcolm Reynolds, who fought in the war alongside his comrade Zoe Washburn. And they lost, so now the Alliance rules the galaxy. Fast forward a few years later and Malcolm's formed a little ragtag space crew who sailed the galaxy doing cargo runs, smuggling and getting into all sorts of illegal trades, and this leads to a bunch of explosive misadventures and mysterious encounters. And now you've got the show Firefly. So Firefly isn't so much a sci-fi as it is a western action sort of series. It was actually really original for its time mashing those two genres together to create interesting worlds and atmospheres. Unfortunately, its niche genre resulted in a niche fan base, which we all know isn't the brightest side of new seasons to come. But the network wasn't innocent in the whole ordeal either. It scheduled the show on Friday nights, which is basically like sending a show to its grave. And its marketing campaigns were also a huge flop, given that they were trying to sell the show like some wacky comedy. And to be fair, it does have Wheaton's signature humor in parts, but that definitely isn't the true spirit of the show. So people who wanted to tune in to a Friday night sitcom were disappointed. But probably their greatest sin were airing episodes out of order. What? How could you guys fuck up that badly? You guys literally had one job. Okay, no, to be fair, you might have some pretty demanding schedules, but still. I was wondering if I was viewing the show through the lens of nostalgia and probably remembering it as being in much better quality than it actually was. I mean, I gotta admit, when I first watched it, I hadn't really seen much else on television. So I decided to rewatch the first step of the first and only season. And what do you know, it's still a fantastic show. A lot of people are quick to call it like the live action version of Cowboy Bebop, and I'm not sure if I can completely vouch for that. Seeing the first two episodes of the anime, it does have a few minor differences, and you know, at least the anime got an ending. The good news is that Firefly did wrap up their story with a movie titled Serenity, and they also did have a line of comic books that sort of filled in the gaps with the rest of the story. So if you can't already tell, I do highly recommend Firefly for anyone looking for a compelling TV experience. I promise between the witty dialogue, the fast-paced action scenes, the sci-fi elements, the world building, that there's something in it for everyone. And for those who don't know, I am kind of casual cosplaying one of the characters in the show, Jane Cobb, who's played by the amazing Adam Baldwin. He's definitely one of my favorite characters in the series. Very very complex dude, watch the series, 
you know what I mean. Anyway, so this was really just an excuse for me to fangirl over my favorite shows. I thought, you know, with all the time that I invest in being a couch potato, I thought might as well put that into some form of creativity. So tell me, what are your hidden gems of shows that you wish other people would watch? You know, shows that ran out of life support during their prime because the marketing or rating sucked, or maybe even series that are still scrambling to stay on air. You never know, you might get a few new people watching your show, maybe even boost its ratings up a bit. Or maybe I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm a pretty small channel and no way is my comment section going to be that influential. But yeah, let me know anyways. So that about does it for my second video out of hiding. I do have a few more of these planned. But until then, stay safe everyone, wash your hands, all that jazz, and I'll see you guys soon with another video.